Yeah, well, really what Debbie asked me to do, and I'm really happy to do it here for the team, for the, for the KWLV team and anyone else that listens in, you know, is to do two things today, which uh, we've really been working on recently. One is, of course, a real revisit to the economic model of MREA. It's one of the four models. There's the economic lead generation budget and organizational. And over the next four months, including this session, we'll, we'll hit all four of those. Um, but, but, and then the second half of today is kind of a neat thing because it reflects back on something that I built in the late, in like 2008, 2009, where I was really trying to help agents understand what Gary Keller said originally. Because he said to me, the very first session I ever, training session I ever went to with him when I joined Keller Williams in, in uh, 1996. And he said, he said, Dave, I really invented Keller Williams profit share so that my best agents could build their own real estate company without having to leave Keller Williams and without having to take all the risks and the hassle. And I don't think people really understand that. They, they, they understand profit share is kind of a, a, you know, sort of a reward system for quote, recruiting people to Keller Williams. It is not, it's deeper than that. So we're going to get to do both of those. And uh, so we'll just, should we just dive in Debbie? I think, uh, do I have, I need to make sure I have permission to, yes, I do. Okay. To, um, to share my screen and what I need to do though, in order to do that, hang on one second. I need to power up a, something right now. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to, well, this, you know, it's interesting. Hang on a sec. I'm just, we're doing a little technology run here because if I don't have it, loaded up in my up on my live screen live then I can't share it okay so here we go back and share the screen and here we go so I want to, I'm going to send this Debbie to you to you know so that you can share it with the team uh, I'm going to send a PDF version of this but it's good for people to take as you know many notes as they can quick. And here's here's what I uh, when Gary Keller and I were putting together uh, MREA, and we said, you know, we both know the power of goal setting and the power of doing smart goals. Smart goals are S specific, M measurable, A actionable, meaning they lead to action, R realistic, in that it, you know there's a 50-50 chance you can do it. It's a stretch but it's not unreasonable and then time bound. So smart goals are really important and they drive all businesses. And one of the things that, that mega agents do is they start to get smart about business, they get more analytic. Uh, and, as, and as Debbie says, they do the math. So what I wanna to do today is understand what we mean by the MREA economic model. And uh, the first thing to understand is that it is about the magic and power of goal setting and action planning. It's probably the thing that the top eight or 10% people in the world do. They have written goals. Those goals are specific in it and they lead to action, you know, the one, three, five. And that's important because it, it's what empowers people to get things done they wouldn't or not, not normally do. And it's what we call going from E to P. Entrepreneurial is where I just put energy at it and enthusiasm and go for it and all that stuff, you know. Nothing wrong with that, but the point is, it only leads you to a ceiling of achievement. You bounce off that. And what you want to do is go get purposeful, go from entrepreneurial to purposeful. And that means you have focus, which is goals. That means you have options, which you're doing things that other people, normal people are not doing. You're following models and you're implementing systems and you're, you're allowing yourself to be held accountable. So here's the key. The key to this whole thing is you gotta know what you want, your goals. This helps you define and clarify your goals. Number two, you gotta know why you wanna do it. In other words, what are my reasons? What is my big why or what are my whys for going after this? It's gonna take hard work. It's gonna be adversity. It's not gonna be easy. There's gonna be things that go wrong. Uh, how? Uh, and how are we going to get there? What's our action plan? What are we actually going to do to cause these things to happen? This takes it from wishful thinking to want to, to will do. And that's really important. And then, and then we want to know when are we going to do it? Gary Keller said, if it doesn't hit your calendar, you're not serious about it. So what do we do to time block toward it? Now, 
in this covering of the economic model, I'm not going to cover all of these things like action plan time blocking, but I am gonna say why it is that the economic model and thinking about that leads automatically to those things. And then the final thing is, are you getting accountability? Are you staying on track? Gary Keller says 10% of success is having written goals. Another 10% of success is having an is a, a um, action plan to achieve those goals. But 80% of success, Gary says, is accountability. Be, not only the accountability of it's to be, it's up to me and not playing victim, but the other one where you allow someone to hold you accountable so you stay on track with the five questions. What were you trying to do? How did you do? How do you feel about that? What are you going to do now? What could get in your way? Those are the five questions. They take 10 minutes. Accountability session ought to only take 10 minutes. If it takes longer than that, you're into therapy. And, uh, you know, why you're trying to find some excuse for why you didn't do what you were going to do. And, yeah, therapy is okay. can be effective. Training is very important, but it's not accountability. So what's the MREA economic model? Well, it's, as, as Debbie says, it's do the math. You need to know your desired income. You need to know your cost of sale and expenses. You need to know the gross commission you need to reach your goal. You need to know your average sale price or average commission per closed sale. These are, these are the analytic sides of being in business. You're not winging it anymore. You're working it on real numbers. You're doing the math. Um, what share of your business is going to be on the seller side? What share is going to be on the buyer side? You know, that's a, that's a big choice for anyone along the way of their, their career. What is your conversion rate of listings to sales? In other words, how many of your seller listings sell and how many of your buyer listings, i.e. buyer rep agreements, end up in an accepted purchase offer and a closed home? Uh, what are the conversion rates from, from appointments to listings? If you have an appointment with a seller, what percent of the time does that turn into a listing? Same with on the buyer side. So do you know your conversion ratios? This is all about conversion ratios. And then what's the conversion rate of your leads to appointments. And by the way, you got to be careful on this definition of leads. A lot of people think if, oh, if somebody just clicked on my, um, uh, my, my uh, listing, uh, that that's a lead or that I got something from, from uh, Zillow, that's a lead. No, 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 no. Gary and I would say it's not a lead till it's a two-way conversation. In other words, if they've reached out to you and you've reached back to them, okay, now you have a, maybe you haven't talked personally, but now you have a two-way communication. But if you've just uh, said something to them or they've just said something to you, that's not a lead yet. And a lot of people, you know, kind of blow up the number of leads. Oh, I've got tons of leads. No, you don't. You have tons of possibilities. You have tons of suspects. But it's not a lead until there's a two-way communication. Then the question is, once you start that dialogue, then what percent of those uh, make it to an appointment? So let's take a look at, the again, the MRA model. Do the math. Now, there's... Let me let me kind of go. I'm going to share another another screen here, Debbie, uh, because I think I think it's um, kind of critical. I, I just want to uh, I just want to to guide people to go to uh, their their MREA business plan, for example. And take a look because in there we talk about the economic model. We say at the millionaire level, if you want to net a million dollars, you're going to have to gross 2.4, and you're going to they're splitting it on even on the buyer seller side, and your cost of sale is a little higher on the buyer side, and you get so 700,000 cost of sale, 700,000 operating, and a million net. Now, by the way, the general formula is 30, 30, 40. We'll talk about that. 30% cost of sale, 30%. Uh, expenses, 40% to your bottom line. We're focused on the bottom line. And on the, on the millionaire real estate agent, we say, here's what it looks like, right? It's, it's, it, we need 25 buyer appointments, 20, 26, we'll round it off, 26 listings, which lead the listings taken, which lead to buyers sold and listings sold, which leads to 27 sales a month. That was on an average sale price of $250,000 at the time. So it was going to take 320 closed units to net a million dollars. Now, I want uh, to take us out of here. Hang on a sec. Ah, ah, I know what I did. Okay. So let's go back to, 
to this. And now let's make it something that we can get our arms around. And I like to use a round number of, I want a net income of $100,000. Now, by the way, you'll find out when we look at this formula, if it, once you plug in the conversion ratios, all you have to do is, is if you want more, if you want to make 200,000, just multiply the numbers by two at the end. You'll see what I, where I'm going. Uh, if you want to make a million dollars, then you multiply them by 10. Uh, so we're kind of starting out with this fundamental look at it at 100,000. So here's what I'm saying. I want to net from my real estate practice $100,000. What's my economic model? Well, the first thing is I need to go to how much do I need to uh, gross? Well, the MRA formula is 30% cost of sale, which would include what you pay the market center cap and that sort of thing, 30% and then also what you pay any other agent on your team, 30% expenses, 40% net. Now, that's not a have to. You can net whatever you want. You can net 10, 20, 30 percent. We're just saying in any business, in any MREA level of operation, you can net 40. And we know people that net over 50 uh, because they really have reduced their expenses and they're doing most of their own production, which is great. No problem with that. So what does that mean? Well, we take our gross income we want, which is 100,000. We divide it by 0.4, which is the 40 percent. And that means I need to gross, I need to bring in commissions total of $250,000 in order to net 100. So we have to be careful now in the world because we always love to say, oh, I've sold $10 million in real estate, but we're not converting that to take home money. And then we say, oh, I earned, I earned 150,000 in commission. Well, no, you made 150,000 in commission. You didn't earn it yet because it's not take home pay. So what we're looking at when we say $100,000 is net take home pay before taxes, of course, taxes is a whole different issue or any other contributions or whatever. It's the net pre-tax dollar you're taking home, right? Basically your salary, your income. All right, so we need 250,000. So how do we get there? Well, first of all, we're gonna decide, but you can decide differently. We're gonna split it 50-50 between sellers and buyers. We're gonna say we should do the same number. Now, some people in their, at some point in their career say, no, I wanna do more 70% listing, 30% buyers. I haven't delegated the buyer side yet. You know, I want more sellers, that's fine. So you can make it 80, 20, you can make it 100%. I knew a, a lady, Marsha Bain in Arlington, Texas. She was 100% on the seller side. She referred out all her buyers. So she did get a, a referral fee on her buyers, but she didn't work with them. Anyway, you could, you could count that in as referral income. The point is though, to keep it simple in our economic model, we therefore need $125,000 commission earned on each side. Well then, what's our, our, what's our equation? Well, I asked Debbie what in general in Vegas, the average closed commission was per side. And she said, it's around 9,000. So, but you would figure this for yourself. It's a number you need to know. Maybe in your target market, it's 12 or 15 or 20. You're in an upscale area. It, or it might be less, it might be seven, it might be six, whatever it is for you. See, these are the numbers you need to know. You need to know uh, what your average commission is per side. Uh, and if it's different for sellers and buyers, well then, okay. So what we know is in this formula is that we, to, we need, we take the 125,000, divide it by nine. So we need, I rounded off 14 sales per side. We need 14 in a year. To hit our goal, we need 14 listings that sell and 14 buyers that, that close under contract. Okay, so let's, let's kind of play with some conversion ratios. Let's say that 80% of my listings sell. Now it might be vary from buyers and sellers. You, know, you may find that 90% of your, of, of your listings sell, but your buyers, you know, you, you start working with them and they go iffy and maybe it's only 60 or maybe it flips. Maybe your buyers are for sure. Once they sign up with you, they're a done deal, 80, 90 percent. But sellers, you're taking some of them. Some of them are trying to overprice it. All that stuff could be less. So here's the point. You need to know in your game what your conversion ratio is of, of seller listings to closings and buyer listings to closings. Right, just so, so we're gonna we're gonna just say that we average on general eighty percent of our listings sell, eighty percent of our sellers sell, eighty percent of our buyers buy a home. So that means we need to take eighteen listings on each side. Remember, we're we're calling a listing 
a seller listing or a buyer listing, which a buyer listing really means a buyer rep agreement, something signed with the buyer that says they're committed to working with you. And of course, you're committed to working with them, which is why they should sign a buyer rep agreement, mutual commitment. So then we need to know uh, what is the conversion? Well, if we say that 50% of people we meet with actually list with us. Now, yours might be better. You may find up with sellers that you show up 80, 90% uh, of them list with you. Great. You may find if you meet with a buyer that 60, 70, 80% of them. But I'm being conservative because I think it's really good when you do economic models to be conservative because you're setting a target and you want, you want to make sure you hit it. And it's always better to be a little on the conservative side than the overly optimistic side. So we're going to say, okay, I need 36 appointments on each side of the equation, buyers, sellers. This is for my annual goals. So what's that mean? To reach my net income goal of $100,000, I need 72 total appointments for the year, which is six a month, three sellers and three buyers. So to round it off, I would just say to myself, you know, I'm going to hold myself accountable to one new buyer appointment and one new seller appointment per week. See, what's really neat about this, you can say, well, $100,000 or $250,000 sounds like a lot. And then you say, well, but it's only one person a week. It's only one buyer and one seller. And that's just an appointment. That's not a listing taken or a sale. That, we're, we're, you know, that happens later. That's a less percentage. So here's we go. That was the, the economic model. The whole goal of it was to say, how many appointments do I need per month or per week on the seller side and the buyer side? To hit my goal. Now we know it. See, that's the magic of this. Now I know what I need to do. Now I can take action in the short term and I can hold myself accountable. If I'm not, if I'm not having, if I just last month, I didn't have three seller appointments and three buyer appointments, what am I going to do to get that cranked up? Right now we go then to the lead generation, but that's a different model. Understand that's it. We're going to, that's another session we're going to have. So here's the thing. The, 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 the key is this, just to, to hit our goal, we need to stay accountable to our weekly and monthly targets. And that means we need some sort of feedback system, some meeting with person that said, what were you trying to do? How did you do? How do you feel about that? What are you gonna do now? What could get in the way? Those five questions. So we need an accountability session on a weekly basis probably to hit these targets. Number two is we need to ask ourselves what activities will lead to this number of appointments, right? And that means how many leads will it take to hit this number of appointments? And that's up to you because there's a big, again, as I said, it depends on how you define a lead. You know, if a lead comes to you from a past client and they need to sell, that's it. You know, that's easy. You know that. But on the other hand, if you've had to reach out to people and ask for referrals, that's a different level. And if you're trying to convert uh, internet leads into appointments, okay, that's a whole different one. That's a lot lower conversion. So the question is, where is your best method for lead generation? And what is the one that's getting you the, the best return? And will you stay focused on that level of lead generation? And there's another part of the accountability. How many calls am I making? How many mail outs am I doing? How many calls around just listed? I mean, I was sending out just listed, just sold cards. I mean, how many, how many calls do I make around a listing to see who else needs to list in that area? There's all sorts of scripts and dialogues. And by the way, they're in the book Shift. The scripts and dialogues are in the book Shift. That's the book you really want to go to for the pragmatic, hands-on, tactical part of real estate. MREA is about what we're talking about, the strategic, the big picture, the analytic, the business-like picture. But what are you going to do to stay focused on lead generation? And who's going to hold you accountable? Is it going to be a peer partner? Is it going to be a coach? You're going to pay for that coach to hold it really accountable. Who is going to be your accountability person? And then, and then you just always have to ask yourself, what knowledge and skills do you need to master? What, what knowledge do you need to increase? Maybe it's more targeting in your market. What skills? Maybe it's the skill of asking for business. Linda McKissick's secret. You know, you have to learn how to ask for business and not be attached to the answer. Or maybe you're a marketeer you're making offers. That's what's in Find the Motivated. Chapter four of, of shift is all about lead generation. The two kinds, asking for business and attracting business. Both of those, they're, they're equally powerful, depends on which one you want to use, but how are you doing in your skill area? Because you still are going to be practicing to take it as high as you can. And then how are your attitudes? I mean, 
I've been doing a lot of seminars recently for people in this COVID time and the shutdown time about their attitudes. And I'm saying, you know, there's three big attitudes for high achievers, intention, optimism, resilience. Intention is what we're talking about here, that I know what I want, how, uh, you know, why I want it, how I'm going to get it, and when I'm going to do it, and how I'm going to be held accountable. And the second one is optimism, that in the face of anything, I always figure out, I can figure a way. I can get what I want. I am in control of the outcome and the destiny, right? And resilience. How do, how do I deal with appointments and disappointments and, and things going wrong and things falling through and people not telling me the truth and all that kind of thing? Am I mentally tough? Can I stay calm in the chaos? So all of this underpins the idea of doing the math, but the thing is the formula we just went through is the key to having powerful goals that show you a way to get there and get you to where you want to go so that you can think big, aim high, act bold. You do the math, you do the work, you're going to reap the rewards, and you're going to live large. That is powering up with the MREA economic model. So Debbie, did you want to uh, open it for, uh, for questions or I think we've got, we've got one question. I see people can post them in the group chat maybe or, or speak up if they want to. Scott asked, um, what are the five accountability questions? Yeah, here are the five accountability questions. It's really easy. What were you doing? No, what were you trying to do? Which means what are your goals? On the 411, what were your goals? What were you trying to do? Number two is, how did you do? That's the feedback loop. What numbers did you actually hit? I was going to call 10 people. I called eight. Okay. The third one's a big one, and that is, how do you feel about that? Because we're all emotionally driven. We all are emotionally driven. And it's important to know. See, sometimes if you feel bad about something, you, you change, you change your, your approach. If you feel good about something, you reinforce it and do more of it. So it doesn't matter. The point is, are you in touch with how you feel about the results you're getting? And then the, the fourth one is, and what are you going to do now? Basically, what are your next goals? Are you changing them? Are we going to just keep it the same way? Whatever it is, what are you going to do now? And the fifth one is kind of one of those, what could get in your way? It's not a negative question. It's the realistic question. Is there something that could get in the way of you, of you doing now what you just said you were going to do? So those, you know Debbie, are, those, 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 are, those are the five questions. What I love about those questions, Dave, is it puts everything back on the person. There's nothing that you leave with having to do it. It lets them self-discover. What are they going to do or where are they going to go? Well, that's right. And that's always where it needs to be. You know, it always needs to be on the person uh, who is, who is, you know, who is doing that. Absolutely. Hang any on a second. I just need to, move I just on need to, to, I'm just going to, well, well, you go ahead see if there's any more questions coming in and I want uh, uh, to get to. Yeah, you look like to, you want to answer, ask a question. I see you're muting, muting yourself. You haven't met some of our newer agents are on here. Big Maddie joined us recently. He's been fun having in the office. He's going to lead a team for us. I see he's unmuted and has a question for you, Dave. Sure. Yeah. Ask. Hey, Dave, how you doing? I'm doing good. And welcome aboard. Thank you so much. I've been here, I think, a couple of weeks now, just just settling, settling in. There you go. Well, plug in, you know, settle in, plug in. There's a lot of energy and a lot of uh, a lot of wisdom hanging around there. So plug in. Glad, glad to have you on board. Absolutely. Um, you really uh, came through with the questions that uh, I really needed was the accountability questions. But uh, as a newer agent here coming here with a little bit of experience um, uh, and wanting to implement this model, what what is my number one thing to go to just my, my lead generation or what, what, what is my number one thing to set? The number you? one thing to do is read the book. I really mean, you know, because there's so much clarity and wisdom that you'll get because you're experienced. So if you can take that MREA, start there, um, look at the four page table of contents. I said to Debbie and, and, and uh, the team, they should have uh, a one page, what I, highlighted is the is the the key pages of MREA but you can just go to the table of contents and scan through that and see which topics are the most interesting to you I mean most most credible but I would say it's worth scanning through the entire book uh, and understanding the economic model and understanding the lead generation model and applying that to yourself and understanding particularly as you build a business 
and start to add people into it, really focus on that page 196 to 203. Page 196 to 203, it's only seven pages, but it is the path to building a powerhouse business and who to hire first and what to have them do. Now, there's a lot of other in-depth stuff that, that Debbie and the team can guide you to about leverage and job descriptions and all of those things, because we've really, we've really studied that and articulated it very clearly. But I would say the first thing to do is really get familiar with that book. And that's definitely what I'm doing. So I'm glad to hear I'm on the right track and I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Good. No, you're welcome. Thank you for being here. Any other, any other questions or should we hop into the second part of our presentation? Well, I would say also, Debbie, that if people send in questions to you, we can still answer them. Even if it's about this first part, we can answer it at the end of, the, of this presentation and then any other questions. And I know that you'll bring any questions to our future meetings. When's our next one? August 13th? Is that August it? 13th at two o'clock. And we're going to be talking about the organizational model, which is where I think agents make the biggest mistakes. Well, they do. It's the biggest opportunity, but it's also the one that's easiest to make uh, very costly mistakes in. Absolutely. So I'm excited to do that second. Yeah, good. I'm going to let you hop into the next session, the next part. All of right. It. Well, let's, yeah, this is a, so what's interesting about us is, we, we get, and I mean us, Gary Keller and the company, is that we really care about business. We really care about business. And that means that, that um, we want agents to think more like business people than salespeople. And we want them to think like they're building a business more than the idea that they're just being an individual producer. Now, to accomplish anything in real estate, you have to be a producer. There's no question. You have to know your game. You have to know finance and contracts and and uh, and property evaluation and you need to be able to make great presentations and negotiate win-win agreements and be able to ask for business or market it and have it attracted to you so there's lots of skills involved in the game and it is about being a high achieving top producer but once you get to that level once you've generated a lot of leads or once you want to be more productive yourself then you're going to get leverage because that's going to make you more, do more dollar productive. You're going to be doing things you get paid more for, and you're going to be having administrative people handling all those things that are, by the way, going to also add to your, your consumer satisfaction and your reputation. And then you slowly start to delegate pieces of the buyer side and then maybe pieces of the listing side. And you can get to the seventh level. We'll talk about that later. But the idea is you're building a company. And so what I wanted to share with Debbie, because I asked, I asked Gary at the front end, Gary, you built this company. I love it. It's the future of real estate. I said that I'd been uh, 12 years with Century 21. I became a, 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 a mega uh, regional director for them. And then ultimately one of six divisional presidents of Century 21 out of Dallas, Texas, hold uh, seven states called Century 21 South Central States. But I saw this little company starting in Austin back in 88. They were nothing. This is tiny little company in Austin, but I knew they had the future of real estate. I could tell the way they the more I studied their formula. And of course, that was really wonderful because six years later, I got to join them uh, with Mo Anderson and Gary Keller and uh, build this. Now, I asked Gary, I said, so what, what, what's really the secret to this idea of profit sharing? And he said, Dave, it's easy. I wanted my best agents to have the chance to own and build a profitable real estate company without taking the risks, without having to invest a lot of money uh, and, and without disturbing the rest of their focus in, in their life uh, and not have to leave Keller Williams to do it. And he said, profit share is the way to do that. So I want to really give people a different view of what profit share really is. It's a way to build your own real estate company. So the thing to remember is that you have Keller Williams is a wealth building mindset. We believe in great service. We believe in top production. We believe in high performance, but we have a mindset about building financial independence. And we believe you have several choices in Keller Williams of long-term income generation. Number one is you can have a great single agent real estate career. I mean, you hear it around Keller Williams a lot of talk about teams and MREA and all that, but you know what? We honor the individual agent who just wants to have a great career themselves, stay in control, keep it simple, build their own reputation, 
They love working with buyers and sellers. Um, and some of our very, very top agents, even some of our very top profit share earners like Althea Osborne, she never really got into the idea of building a team. She loved to just work with sellers and buyers herself. She had a really, a really magnificent admin who worked with her. And so she could be doing mega amounts of business. You know, at that time, maybe three, four, five hundred thousand dollars of commission earned, which at that time, you know, like 20 years ago was a big deal. Uh, but she did that, but she didn't want to build a team. So she wanted to be a great single agent. So that's number one choice. Number two is you can build a seventh level MREA business, just what we've been talking about. If you follow that path to the seventh level, you can have a business like Linda McKissick, where everybody is doing some piece of the business. She had four admins. She had five buyer specialists. She had one and a half listing specialists. And she had a, a, a manager running the whole thing for her. She only had to spend five or six hours a week. Uh, overseeing a, a business that was doing 350 transactions, 1.2 million in GCI and 400,000 to her bottom line. And yet she wasn't sh showing properties. She wasn't doing listings. And that only took her eight years to do. So we call that a seventh level MREA business. Study that book. That's the vision of that. The third one is you can become a personal uh, millionaire real estate investor. That was our second book, MREI. Uh, Investing in real estate is the greatest thing other than owning a business. It's the greatest thing there is for wealth building. And we're right around it all the time. So why wouldn't you become a millionaire real estate investor or even better yet, make it part of your business. Work with investors as well as being an investor. You could do that. The fifth one you can do and in the real estate business is start your own real estate brokerage company. But that's dangerous. And I want to that's what I want to hit. A lot of people think, oh, I want my name on the sign and I want to, you, Debbie came to me in, in 1995 and uh, said, Dave, uh, or I mean, uh, 2005 and said, Dave, I think I'm ready. I want to, I want to own a Keller Williams market center. And I went, no, you don't. Debbie. <laughs> I'd been advising her about building her business. She had gotten her personal production up over a million dollars. And I went a million a year in, in commissions. And I went, no, you don't. You do not want to be a broker. Please, you don't want to own a real estate company. It's the most fragile, the most chaotic, the most complex part of the real estate industry with the thinnest margin of profit. Stay, stay a mega agent. That's where the real game is. That's where the real money is. But look what Debbie did. She went and did it because she's pretty independent. But look what she's sure. built. Look what she's built, a magnificent company. Thank you, Debbie. What's that? Is somebody making a comment? Thank you, Debbie. Oh, yeah, there great. you go. So Brittany, anyway, just mega agents that just joined us. She's actually with kids in Utah listening in. Oh, here. wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so make sure we mute everybody because I want to I want to get this want to get this fully there. But a lot of good acc accolades. You can chat in accolades to Debbie. She's been wonderful. One of the most fantastic broker owners, just like Mo Anderson. They really know how, or Gary Keller. They know how to run a company. They know how to do it right, but it's not an easy thing. I'm going to talk about that. Or the, here's the sixth thing that most people don't understand. You can grow a Keller Williams profit share business. And I mean, it's a business. It's not a gift or anything. It's a business. So let me show you how it works. This is really important. So first of all, we went, we made this very clear. We studied Robert Kiyosaki and he said, there's four ways you can get cash flow into your life. One, you can be employed. Two, you can be self-employed. Three, you can own a business. Four, you can make investments. Now, what we taught with MREA was how to turn your self-employed job into a business. It's truly a business. Then we said you can even go further and become a millionaire investor, or you can combine it all and have a business that's also working with investors. And there you go. But what's interesting is when Gary and I looked at this, we said, there's one zone, there's one zone that is, is not covered in this. It's somewhere over to the right of BNI, and it's called Keller Williams Profit Share. It's the most pure form of passive income ever. You don't have any responsibilities to run it like you do in a business. You don't have to overwatch it or put up big money at the front end like you do with investing. It sits over there, and a lot of people, because it kind of isn't easy to categorize, don't understand it, but you will after we do this talk right now. So here's the thing that I want to read you to talk, to, I want to talk about with you. There's nine things you have to do to build a real estate company. There's nine. If you decide to open a brokerage with your name on the sign, there's nine things you have to do. And they all cost money and they all are risk. Number one is you have to get a facility. 
buy it or lease it, long-term lease it, doesn't matter. Number two is you have to build out and furnish it. You have to, and that's not inexpensive. And you've got to do all that before there's any money coming in. Build it out, furnish it. Three, you've got to install all your equipment and technology. Oh yeah, they ask for money for that too. And that's all has to do, again, no income coming in. Number four, you have to hire staff unless you want to be the manager and mostly you don't or administrator or receptionist. So you got to do all of that. Then guess what you have to do? Against all the other competitors out there, you have to recruit agents. You have to recruit them to your, to your vision, to your economic model. And they got lots of choices, including the best one there is, which is Keller Williams. So then number six, you've got to deliver on what you promised. You got to deliver the training, the marketing, the technology, whatever you said was the reason they should join you. You've got to deliver on it. And then you have to retain professional services, a broker, unless you want to be the broker, legal, accounting, all those services. Then you have to deal with the, all the regulatory agencies, the real estate commission, the IRS. They were, and by the way, they don't care if you don't know. If you don't know their rules, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. If you're violating them, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna get in trouble. Uh, you know, and you, or you're going to have to hire somebody to get you out of trouble. And then nine, you've got to oversee it. You've got to manage it. You've got to make sure people are doing their job. You've got to hire good people, fire them if they're not doing their job, hold them accountable, run the budget. All of this, this is, none of this is easy. So running a real estate company, number one, remember, it's not easy. Now, in the Gary Keller model, he said, you can do this. You can own a company. You can own a company with only having to do one thing. You had to do it anyway. You had to do it anyway. It's one of these nine, but all you have to do is this, and that is recruit producing agents. And actually, to do a Keller Williams profit share business, you actually don't have to recruit them we have recruiters all you have to do is refer them build a relationship suggest they talk to somebody in keller williams get them in connected with, to that person in keller williams uh and then they are the ones that and then be supportive of that and then when they join and name you as their sponsor now they're in your profit share company well what does that mean dave well let me show you how it looks let me just show you how it looks here's my profit share company it started in 1996 it's when I joined Keller Williams. I've only brought in six people. That's all. I mean, it's really kind of pathetic with my leadership position and my connections in the real estate industry, but I was helping Keller Williams grow and helping other people recruit and bring people into Keller Williams. But anyway, six. Now, in my seven levels, and you can go into details later, but basically in the Keller Williams system, the people underneath you, so it's your company, This everyone in this company is underneath me, right? Everyone, all six of those, they come under me in the tree, in the profit share tree. And then they sponsor people. And I get paid on seven levels alone. The first level, second, third, all the way down to seven levels of people sponsored in below me. And the money, you know, you can get into the details of this, but it's all really brilliantly designed. I get paid on seven levels. So I have 1,000 176 agents in my company, the Dave Jenks Profit Share Company. And it's paid me $1.65 million since I opened it 24 years, 24 years ago. Pure passive income, what we call mailbox money. It just gets sent to me, ACH, into my checking account every month, automatically on the 21st, right? So, the interesting thing, well, let me just show you what that looks like on an annual basis. So this is what it looks like. See, I mean, it started low, of course, like all things. It ramped up, got up to about $66,000. Oh, and then we ran into the 2007, 2010 downturn. And it went all the way down to like $31,000. But it still was money and it didn't go to zero and it didn't go negative and I didn't go bankrupt. Then it started building its way back up. And look at this. In the last five years, it's averaged about $160,000, $170,000 to me of pure profit, pure passive income. I don't do anything for that. I don't have to oversee it. I don't have any risk for it. It comes into my checking account every month. And there it is. So that, see that. Now, by the way, just to get a feeling of that, my 1,100 agents, my almost 1,200 agents, they do about $250 million of real estate sales every month. I have a billion dollar company, the Dave Jenks Profit Share Company in Keller Williams. 
is a billion dollar company. It does a billion dollars plus $1.3 billion a year in real estate sales. And it sends me $180,000, $170,000, $160,000 of pure passive income. Now, so I'm a piker in the game. I'm a piker. Linda, Linda McKissick came to me in 1999 and said, Dave, Gary Keller is wanting us to pro forma a bunch of other, you know, uh, things other than listing and selling real estate, like, you know, commercial uh, real estate, or maybe property management or investment or mortgages or whatever. And she said, I'm not interested in any of that. What should I do? And I said, well, I think you should try profit share, treat it as a business. And she said, well, okay, tell me, Dave, how's that working? So I showed her how it all worked and sponsorship. And she looked at it and her eyes got really big, just like Althea's did when she invented the system with Gary Keller back in, uh, back in uh, 1987. Uh, she said, oh my God, I saw this as, as absolutely the biggest potential for passive income I've ever seen. That's what Linda said. So she started using her relationship. She started bringing people and she was going to all kinds of national training and all of that with Mike Ferry and Howard Brinton and other people. And she was building all these wonderful relationships. And she kept saying to him, you need to, gotta, you gotta check out this Keller Williams thing. But remember, this was back when we only had two or three, 4,000 agents. Now we have 172,000 agents. So, I mean, this was in the early days when no one had ever heard of Keller Williams, but she kept saying to her friends, you gotta check it out, check it out. And she'd refer them to a team leader or refer them to if they were a mega to Gary Keller, or Mo Anderson or whatever, me, and um, they would, they would join. Now, let me show you what Linda, what her profit share company. So she and Jimmy, now, by the way, there's a great advantage in Keller Williams. If you're a husband, wife team, you get to stack in the system. That means you have two levels. You sponsor your spouse and then everyone else you bring in is named under that spouse. So in a sense, you're operating on two levels and, and we're counting. That's what the McKissicks were honored last year as the, as the highest um, earning couple in Keller Williams of profit year. But they began same time I did in 96. Now they have 32 people, not six, 32. Now they've sponsored more than that, but people come and go. And, but they have right now 32 people in their first level. But in their seven levels, they have 9,000. So they have a, a real estate company, the McKissick family, profit share company, has 9,000 agents in it. And I have no idea what its monthly production is. It's got to be some massive amount, probably six, seven times higher than me. That might be a, six, a five or six billion dollar real estate entity, just them in that company. Uh, and their total earnings, they have been paid, get this, 12 million dollars 12 million dollars amazing uh and i'll show you let's take a look at what it looks like annually so you can see it started low as it always does any great thing starts low even real estate production if i looked at the at the earning curve of our top the agents that we honored at the back of mrea the 24 agents and i did their their you know what their production looked like when they started in the business and then where it got to it's what I call a power curve. It starts low. It's like a plane taking off. It has to put in a lot of energy. It's still on the runway, going faster, faster, then it lifts off a little. And then, boy, once the engines are on board, it can stick its nose in the air and climb. Well, that's what happens with real estate careers. That's what happens with Keller Williams profit share companies. So you can see they got all the way up to $458,000. That's annually. They got that in passive income in 2005. Oh, then it dipped. Isn't that sad? it went all the way down to 244,000. I mean, how did they survive 244,000 in pure passive income? In oh, 2007, yeah, that, when people weren't making 244,000. Oh my God, no, they were going out of business, weren't they, Deb? Yeah. So people were closing their doors during that period of time. And here's the thing that's neat about owning a Keller Williams profit share company. It never goes to zero and it never goes negative. It never goes negative. It never asks you to put more money back in to stay in business ever. So the thing is that it's always positive and it never goes negative and it, it doesn't put you at risk in any way. But then now look at how it climbs though. See, as the company really starts to get its game back together, as the industry gets its game back together, Keller, Keller Williams always arises out of adversity. We're going to, Keller Williams is going to rocket ship out of this 
COVID emergency and lockdown we've been, I promise you, we got the technology to do it. We got the wisdom to do it. We got the leaders like Debbie Zoys, uh, local owners to do it. So, so here, they, look at this, all the way up to one and a half million dollars. So in the last four years, they've averaged about 1.3, 1.4 million dollars in profit shared income. Now, people like uh, Mike Brody and, and Althea Osborne, who, well, Mike Brody really, who, who is really only one level. I mean, it's just him, no spouse, no anything else, no double dipping, that kind of thing. And he's, he still makes over $900,000. He's the highest earning individual. So the point is, is by the way, this, this opportunity never goes away because there's always new people joining and Keller Williams is always growing. So you could start now and in 10 years, you could be where Linda is, or you certainly could be where I am, you know? So this, this, is, this is the neat thing about this opportunity. I just wanna get it out there for everybody. Just to have it in your goal list as a, as a, as a sidebar, but there that says maybe, I'm gonna sponsor somebody every two months. I'm gonna do six people a year. Dave did six and it took him a long time. I'm gonna do six in a year. And maybe in 10 years, I'm gonna have the Linda McKissick level, 30 some people in that first level. And, and, then, and then I'm gonna start going up in the multi hundreds of thousands of dollars of pure passive income to me and my family. By the way, it goes on forever. So I have an LLC that the money comes to my LLC, the Dave Jenks Legacy LLC. And in it are my wife, my son and my brother at different percentages. And when I pass, they, they, their percentages all rise because mine gets redistributed and the money still keeps going to them because the money will keep coming to that LLC. It's not tied to me being alive. So it's, it is truly a passive asset you can pass on. So it's passive income, long-term business profit. Remember this, no financial investment, no risk, no liability. Doesn't matter. You're not liable for their actions, anyone on your team. No management responsibilities. You don't have to oversee them, hold them accountable, train them, make them production. Yeah. Keller Williams has all that already in place with really powerful people already doing it for you. So we just say to you, that is a business worth owning. One final thing I wanna leave you with is, so what do you do about it? Here's what you do. You understand and master the referral process. This is just like you do in any referral, getting referrals from your clients, or getting referrals you send out to other agents. Number one, build great relationships with every all the other agents you meet. Build great. Co-broke with people, they'll really enjoy working with you. Get to know them, go to MLS meetings, get to know people, just to get to know them. Have a relationship with them, see how their business is doing. You know, find out about that. What's their family doing, all that. Do it, go to national meetings, connect with them, go on Facebook and start posting things that people are interested in. And, and about doing real estate and about what you've learned and share that and maybe have some you know, groups that meet and get together. Number two is be curious about their business and what they're dealing with, the challenges they're dealing with, all of them. Many of them do not have the support you're getting with Debbie and the team uh, at, at Keller Williams Las Vegas. You're not. Uh, number three is share your own career path and your challenges and how you met those and what you did. Be authentic, be real, you know? Uh, number four, be enthusiastic about KW and, and what it's meant to you and what's available there and how uh, proud you are and, 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 and blessed you are to be part of that company. Introduce them, offer to introduce them to a KW leader, right? Just, to, just, just so that they can meet and talk. Um, and then once, you, once that happens, follow up with them and make sure they're getting the answers they need and you're part of that. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to sell the system. You do not have to recruit. All you have to do is say, well, I'll get you to the person that has that answer. Here's what I found out, but I'll get you to the person that can answer that for you. And then congratulate them when they join the family. Just say, welcome aboard. So glad to have you here. Glad you are in my profit share family. Uh, and I'm gonna guide you on how to build yours too right? You offer that opportunity. So those are just the things to do. It's not, there's nothing arduous about this. That's what Linda said. She said, it's amazing. All I did was use my natural ability to build relationships, my natural integrity and authenticity. And then I, I encouraged people to just at least check out the options. She said, you know, in your career, you should, all, you should at least check out the options you have. 
Why would you not? I mean, anyone working in any other business would look for other options that might be there for them, other businesses, other, other companies. And so, you know, you owe it to yourself to check this out. And by the way, let me tell you who I recommend you go talk to. And then, of course, you follow up just like you would with any referral to make sure you get paid for the referral. Make sure they name you as a sponsor because you're the one that brought them to the table. That's the way it works. If you brought them to their appointment and you were the one and you may, then you were the one that would be named by them as their sponsor. You have to follow up on that to make sure it happens. So do all that and then track the growth of your profit share tree. Keller Williams helps you do it. You get that report every month that shows you your profit share earnings over the last 10 12 years, it shows you how many people are in your first level and each of your levels uh, in your profit share tree. And you can even go in and, and click on the names and go see who is in your profit share tree. You could send them thank you notes if you want to. You could do that. So here's the thing I'm just saying to you. Now go build. Uh, in addition to your own mega business, go build the killer profit share business worth owning. Highly recommended. You know, Dave, when, Here we are, Debbie. Thank you. When when you were meeting with Lyndon and advising her on this, you guys, she came to you. She did a study on it. She wanted to net a million. She wanted to net a million dollars in her um, profit share business. And what was the number that she needed in her first line to do that? She didn't know. I mean, I don't remember having that discussion. I don't. She may. She may, as she tells her story, because you've been to a lot of her things. She may. She may say that that she gave some number. To me, what I got in my sense, once I explained it to her, she said, wow, this is big. This is big. And, and uh, you know, and, she, and I know then she just went out and started, she actually hired an assistant. And that assistant kept a database of all the, all the agents she knew. And she reached out to those agents, one, to do referral business. In other words, say, you know, I want to send you referrals. And how about if you have people move into Denton, you send me referrals, just like Mike Mendoza does. Mike Mendoza does this all over the country. He's one of our top 24 in the back of the MREA, but he does a lot of agent to agent referral business because that is a great source. And Gary, there's another thing that Gary has been trying to help people do is that agent to agent referral business is one of the most lucrative ways to generate leads because agents will send you good leads and those are well-qualified leads usually through relationship and, you know, you just pay a referral fee on that or, and your goal is of course, to be sending them out where you're getting paid the referral fee and, and have that, you know, be going both ways. So I would just say she may have, did she say that she set some number as a goal, Debbie? Yeah. She told me she set a goal of 25 and that she had decided that once she had 25, that was going to be what it would take to net a million. And it seems pretty accurate based on, you know, where she is. Yeah. And I would say that she probably, because the, because people, you bring people in and they don't necessarily stay. Right. So, I mean, because they drop out of the business or whatever. So she's probably sponsored certainly more than 32 people over that time. But I think what happened to her uh, is that once she started feeling the results so she may have set an initial target of the 25, but, uh, and saw that it could maybe get to a million dollars. Um, but I think she's, you know, she's gotten a lot of wisdom on this in retrospect. Uh, but she certainly went out and did it. And she's a good role model for all of us. So any, uh, any new questions? Mute yourself if you have a question and take advantage of being able to ask this wise man something. You know, it's an interesting, I would tell you this is an, I'll just add this as an aside because I think it's important to understand. Agents are building teams and they're deciding what kind of commission arrangement they're going to have for the people on their team. And they always overpay, always, always, always overpay. They think they have to pay 50 or 60 or 70, whatever it is, and bonuses and all this stuff. And you don't, you, you, you know, you can build a powerful team uh, with, with a, uh, where your buyer's agents are making say 35 or 40%, right? Why? Because you have the leads and you have the administrative systems. There's really, if you look at a real estate transaction, there's three pieces, lead generation, servicing the buyer or seller, 
and getting it to closing and managing the transaction. So you're already taking care of two thirds of the business. You're asking them to simply meet with a person and get them under contract either for a listing or in a home. And so the reason I, I put this out there is a really important thing to understand in the world of business and that Gary Keller always, uh, always does what he teaches. So for example, he, here's his quote, and I just wanna say this to any of you that are starting to build teams or are building teams. He said, you wanna find people who are willing to succeed in your economic model. Don't change your economic model because they think it should be different. You want to find people willing to succeed in your economic model. And Gary Keller is the perfect example. And Debbie Zoyce is a great example of, of who gets it. So Gary went out to owners around this country and said, oh, here's, here's the way this works. You have all the responsibility. You have all the liability. You've got to put up all the front end money. We're not taking any responsibility for that at all. We're providing you training, marketing support. We're providing our systems. But all of the financial ends of it, you're taking the risk. Oh, and by the way, if you make a profit, you're going to share half of it with us. What do you mean? I'm taking all the risk. I'm making all the investment. And if I make a profit, I have to share half of it with you? Yeah, that's how our profit share system works. Half of it's going to go to the other agents who built this company by sponsoring people in. And by the way, if you're smart enough to understand, when you are willing to share half your profits, you will make more profit than other owners who aren't. And see, that's what happened. And only the smart owners in the business got that picture. And they came on board. And, and I did the research back in the 2005, 2006. Keller Williams offices across the board are more profitable than other offices in the real estate industry on a per office basis. Now, a lot of the franchise systems don't even track profitability, but because they just want to get paid their royalties or their service fees. But, but the point is though, I know that Keller Williams offices are more profitable to the owner, even with them giving away half of, half of that profit to profit share. So an amazing system, amazing. So what? Uh, I think it's our last Debbie, minute. any questions, any comments? Is this, well, I just wanna know, has this been helpful? I'll chime in. I'm not shy. Uh, it's Matthew again. Yeah, Matthew. This was actually one of the reasons I, I, I sought out, uh, it ended up being Keller Williams when I decided to move over here. I, this was a point in my career where I wanted to take these next steps and it was so unclear to me. And now it's, it's embarrassing. I've had this book for so long and hadn't read it. And, and my leadership saying, Maddie, have you read your book? Maddie, have you read your book? Well, yes, I've, I've read the book and I, I'm in it. So, <laughs> Um, I just want to thank you for really breaking this down. I was waiting for this, and it was very clear and understandable. I took some great notes, and I just wanted to say thank you. You're welcome. And by the way, make sure that, I mean, Patty is a wonderful person to refer people to to talk about the system. I mean, Patty knows this inside and out. She's had, a, she's had time in the business independent of Keller Williams, so it's not just a Keller Williams you know, pitch. She gets it. Uh, Debbie does inside and out and knows people all over the the country that you know so feel feel really your job maddie is not to is not to try and sell people on it it's to try and get them to just look at the opportunity right that's the key this is this is worth investigating and one of the things to understand is that even though keller Williams has been around a long time its profit share keeps growing you know 175 million a year we're up, we're up over 1.3 billion dollars 1.3 billion dollars have been have been shared with agents and i remember uh, mary harker who was a superstar with remax she was kind of the poster child for remax and because she's outgoing she's from dallas works with the dallas cowboy football players and all that high profile and she said you know what she said i was a big influence on growing remax from from three uh like uh, from uh, what was the it was like to say from 4,000 agents to 45,000 agents, right? And she said, I was, they, I was the one they had them talk to and all that, and I was gung-ho. And she said, uh, you know how much money they ever paid me for doing that? Zero. I joined Keller Williams. She said, I'd only been with Keller Williams seven, eight years, and Joe and I are getting $300,000 a year 
in, in income for using our influence to grow Keller Williams. So see, that's the other thing of this. It's, we call it the shoe deal, right? It's, it's sort of like, what did Michael Jordan get, right? He got the shoe deal from Nike. And we believe for agents of influence, this is the shoe deal. In other words, you come in and you use your credibility and your, and your, and your influence and your relationship with other people to get them to at least take a full look at Keller Williams and then they join and, the, and then you get paid for the rest of your life. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so with the profit share and the sponsorship, does it, uh, when you sponsor somebody, do they have to be on your team? No, like, oh no, 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 no. In fact, no, not at all. You, they can, by the way, they can be anywhere. That's a great question. You're asking a wonderful question. So you could know somebody, a relative or just somebody you met or maybe somebody from the city you used to live in that you know is in real estate. Maybe they helped you sell your home there or whatever. If you talk to them, and then, of course, Patty and Debbie can guide you as to which the best local office up there would be for them to talk to, then they go and you set up and you call the team leader. Debbie and Patty tell you who the team leader is. You call the team leader, said, I have a really good friend of mine that I really encourage them to look at Keller Williams. Can you talk with them, please? And the reason you're doing that is to make sure that you're in the line as the sponsor, right? Because the, the agent joining us gets to choose who their sponsor is, but you've got to make sure that you're, you're being clear that you're the one that referred them, right? Yeah. You don't have to be the one that convinced them. You don't even have to be, for example, let's say they, they joined another office and then they did become part of a team in that office. Well, they might be under some pressure to name the leader of that team is their sponsor, but that's not the way Keller Williams works. It's the person who made the referral. You're kind of the procuring cause. You okay. cause them to come talk to us. You should, you, and you're in the number one position to be the sponsor, okay? okay. So you um, can do that anywhere. Okay, I have another question. Sure. So the uh, legalities of like leaving another brokerage company and coming to Keller Williams, um, are you legally allowed to talk about like, and like try to, I guess, try to recruit the other people from the company? Is that a legal thing? Sure. Or I mean, here's the thing. The only thing that, and Candy can advise you on this is, so some people have in their clauses, non-compete uh, provisions, right? They, I mean, their contract of employment with that, but they're very hard to hold, hold up in the real estate industry where everyone's an independent contractor, right? Okay. So. There could be legal issues, but so here's the thing that I would do with you is that I would say, by the way, there's nothing prevents them from talking with somebody. So you're not at risk to have them talk to somebody in Keller Williams. And then that person who's recruiting them is going to have them check about any non-compete issues that they might have with their former brokerage and then deciding how to deal with that. But see, that's not your responsibility. Okay. Right. Well, I just wanted to make sure like that was an okay thing to do. You know, I don't, I don't want to, I just wanted to know the legal fact. Well, so here's the thing. Let me just ask you this. Do, uh, you, are you talking about going back to people who were with your former company? No, no. Because you could do, I mean, unless you, unless there is some contract in writing that's enforceable that says you can't come back and recruit our agents. Because a lot of times, for example, let's say that somebody is a manager for an office. Often their employment contract will say, you cannot, if you leave and go with another brokerage, you can't come back and try and recruit our agents, right? That might be there. But see, that's their legal issue to worry about, not yours. You're simply, all you're doing is simply getting them the opportunity to talk to somebody in Keller Williams. But Candy answered the question. Yeah, um, what I'm going to tell you is that in in Nevada, um, what Dave said had to do having to do with um, with management who are employed by a company, they are the only ones who have non compete in in their contracts. As an independent contractor, there is not a non compete clause for agents. So agents can talk to any other agent at any other time on any other day and introduce them to anybody at uh, Keller Williams and go from there. Okay. So it is absolutely legal. Okay, awesome. 
By the way, and just it's, I want you to know when you think about the value of being with a really smart company, in addition to all the great things that Gary Keller has invented and everything that's available with KW Connect and Command and all, one of the powers of being in business with us is Candy and Patty and Debbie, because what you have is mature, really solid business women and business leaders who know the game and they're there to back you up. So if anytime you have a question like that, there's Candy and Candy knows the legal side of this business inside and out, what an asset she is, not only for us who are in the company, but for our agents to have that kind of, that kind of um, somebody, you know, covering their back. Okay, thank you. You know, dude, I just wanna say something cause I feel like I can be a really good salesperson sometimes and sometimes I can't cause you can usually see what's going on in my mind by looking at my face, right? It kind of gives myself away. So I could never recruit to a company that I didn't believe in. And I feel like there if you, you don't believe in Keller Williams you shouldn't be trying to bring people on board but if you believe that it's changed your life and it's made a difference why wouldn't you want to offer it to other people yeah and i think that's right and when you really look at the fact particularly with this covid thing and all that how many agents are being abandoned by their company they're not getting any support any services there's no there's not zoom meetings there's not zoom connections there's not getting guidance i i mean i i'll give you an example and debbie you may have done similar but you know, the Denver Tech Center up there, the, you know, they were being locked down big by the state and considered a non-essential business. And they went out and they got an attorney to write COVID addendums for their, for their buyers and sellers that they could use, right? And, that, and therefore, they allowed their agents to continue doing a business, business while other agents were shut down not doing any. So I think one of the neat things when you've got intelligent relationship-based muscle on your side like patty and candy and debbie is wow they'll they'll go to bat for you and that's a big deal that's good thank you so much for the time dave we no good to be here thank you i look look forward and by the way i'm going to send uh a uh, both uh, you know a, a pdf version of both of my presentations today and anyone just let patty or debbie know if you want a copy of that and uh, they'll, you know, they'll give it to you. Okay. Right. Thank you so much. Let's give them a round of applause guys. You can unmute Wait. yourself and say cheers. Thank <laughs> you so much, Dave. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye right. everybody.